Good morning. So today, it's my pleasure to present the most important and beautiful subject in mathematics, these are toric varieties. Uh, I start with notation that we already used. So if b is a vector, then by x to b, I mean a product. And we used it when b had all of the coordinates non-negative, and this was just our notation for monomials. Then the difference is that now I allow also negative coordinates, and what I get is called a Laurent monomial. And equipped with this notation, we can come directly to definition of toric varieties. I should say that in the literature, there are a few approaches to toric varieties. And in this lecture, I will focus only on affine and projective toric varieties. So as, as we did before, all our varieties, they come with, with an embedding. They live in some spaces. So I fix k lattice points and affine, oh, I should, respectively projective toric variety. is the closure of the image of the map so i would like to build a laurent monomial map so i would like to use these vectors as monomials to define my map. That's the idea. So first of all, the point will be in OK, so I haven't written where this map is defined, but it will go to the usual affine or to the usual projective space. And the coordinates are just given by Laurent monomials and where I can define this map. So because I allow negative exponents, I cannot allow zeros in my domain. Yes, can you see? For example, for example I would have a problem with, with getting an inverse of x1 if x1 would be equal to 0. Okay, so I take it, I take an x in k star to the n. Yes, so I, uh, I define a map from this domain to the whole affine space and I take the closure. Yes? So if, if you do it to project this space, do you need to require some... No, right now, no. I just take this point as a point oh. in the projective space, and I close it. That's, this doesn't look natural, but I will, I will make a remark about projective toric varieties later. In fact, the second part of the talk will be devoted to projective toric varieties, and we'll change this map a little bit so that it behaves nicer with respect to the projective space. But right now, I don't do that. Uh, now, what's k star here? Well, as I said, k star is just k without zero. Okay, so a definition is really easy. 
that's an advantage of this definition, but uh, the disadvantage is that we completely don't understand the name toric varieties or why this should be interesting, where they appear and so on. So we will so slowly go towards, uh, towards uh, trying to find an answer for this question. Uh, now, let me introduce some names. So first of all, K star to the N is known as the algebraic torus. If you remember from second lecture, we were defining spectrum. So if you want to know this variety as a spectrum, this is the spectrum of the ring where we allow, it's like a polynomial ring, but we allow positive and negative exponents. Yes? So as a vector space, this ring is spanned by all Laurent monomials. And the multiplication is, is obvious. And why is this called an algebraic torus and what properties it has? Well, it's not only a variety, an algebraic variety, it's also a group with the group action coming from coordinate-wise multiplication. In other words, if we have like x1, xn times x1 prime, xn prime, well, it's in, in the obvious way. And if it was non-zero, it will be still non-zero. Very good. So now uh, we explain why algebraic. We explain that this is a group and why this is called a torus. Let us look at the case of complex numbers. So C star is just a punctured plane. If we look at it as, as C, identifying C with R2. In other words, this is a product of a circle with the, we have to remember the module of, uh, of a complex number, yes? Okay, now if we think about it topologically, this factor is contractible. So topologically, C star is not very different from a circle in the complex, uh, in the complex plane. But the circle in the complex plane is no, not algebraic, so this is, let's say, the closest algebraic analog of a of a circle. And now if we square it, again, we have the contractible factor that we don't care about. What do you mean by contractible? Contractible in the topological sense, contractible to a point. Yes, so you can, you can define a map from the space to the interval, continuous, that at the beginning is the identity, at the end it's, uh, it's mapped to a point. But I mean, in, in this case, if, if these topological notions are unclear, I just mean that I, 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 as, as, as I change the time, I contract a line to a point. Okay? Now, here we can really see the usual torus the product of two circles, okay? So I hope this at least a little bit explains the name of the algebraic torus. It's a, it's, it's a higher dimensional, closest algebraic analog of, of the usual torus. Now, we have a definition of toric varieties and we would like to know some examples. So can anyone give me some example of a toric variety? from the definition, some easy example maybe, just to check if it's understandable. Take some very easy monomials and what's the image? Okay. Sorry? Affine space. Affine space, that's a very good example. Affine spaces. So why are affine spaces toric varieties, affine toric varieties? What kind of monomials do we take? 
And we can take it as the identity. We can take it as the identity. And notice that the image will not be everything, but the closure will be everything. So we take all points with non-zero coordinates. In the closure, we get everything. And in the same way, projective spaces. So in some sense, one can think about toric varieties as vast generalizations of the usual spaces. And now, uh, another example is a cuspidal curve. And I give you just the equation. And maybe you can see that this is the, the zeros of this equation are is equal to the image of a monomial map. What kind of a monomial map? So it will be in A2, so I need two monomials that satisfy this equation, and this should be. Well, you know, there are not many monomials in one variable. I mean, there are infinite, yes? Is it square and is it square? Very good. Yes, I mean, it's very easy to see that they satisfy this, uh, this equation. Okay, now we have already encountered several times, but maybe we have not used the names of Segre and Veronese embeddings. So what are Segre and Veronese embeddings? As I said, we already have seen them during the lecture and maybe even we, we used those words. So if we want a Veronese map, it's given by all monomials of a given degree. So in particular, it's given by monomials. So in particular, the image is toric. So the Veronese variety is often referred to as the image of the map given by all monomials of a given degree. And Segre refers when we have a few projective spaces and we take monomials of degree equal to the number of projective spaces, and we want one variable coming from each projective space. We have seen example of P1 times P1 several times. And again, these are monomials, so the image is a toric variety. Okay. Any questions about the definition? Now, Algebraic geometers, they don't really like to work in coordinates, and there is a more intrinsic way to define toric varieties, and let us make a step towards that. But before this, we need to have a good understanding of torus, algebraic torus, and maps from it. Let's, let me define a character. This is a really important definition that will be coming back in next lectures. Okay, so a character of a torus is a map from a torus to the field without zero that is both an algebraic map and it's a morphism of groups. Yeah, so a torus is a group, K star is a group with the usual multiplication. Can anyone give me an example of a character of a torus? So we want a map, yes, given by algebraic things, that is here, this will be some maybe combinations of Laurent monomials so that it's well defined on a torus. And we want it also to be a morphism of groups. Any ideas? Any coordinates? Sorry? Any coordinates. Any coordinates, that's a very good example. So I can send x1 to xn. Any other examples? 
Matthias, what does algebraic mean? Algebraic here means that if I consider this as a variety and this is a variety, it should be a morphism of varieties. But um, uh, yes, maybe I shouldn't use uh, that is algebraic map of algebraic varieties. Map of algebraic Um, okay, but in, in our setting, if you remember from lecture two what is really a map of algebraic varieties, it means that it takes the functions from here to functions from here, which in our terms it has to be a combination of Laurent monomials. So are, is there any other combination of Laurent monomials than just Xi that would make a character? That's an easy question. Yes? Maybe product of coordinates? Product of coordinates. Something more? Very good. That's a good example. We can also take the inverse. So we can also take the inverse. We are closer and closer to the answer. Every <coughs> Laurent monomial. Every Laurent monomial. And it's an exercise for you to prove that there is nothing else. So you can think about characters of torus as points in Zn. So characters of T, their set is usually denoted by a letter large M, and we can identify it with Z to the N. But notice that in this definition, I don't need coordinates. I can just take maps of a torus to, to K star. Now, I don't want to consider this just as a set. These sets come with an additional structure of a group. Here, I can just add integral points, and I get an integral point. So notice, in terms of monomials, this corresponds, when do I add exponents of a monomial? If I multiply two monomials. So I can also define a group structure here. If I take two characters, and if I want to add them, let me use maybe a different color for this addition. So this is a blue addition. So I want this to be a character. So it has to be a function from a torus to k star. So what value does it take on a point of t? Well, I have to evaluate one character. I have to evaluate the second character. Now these are monomials. And to add exponents, I need to simply multiply them. OK? So you can treat this as a definition of a blue addition. So this is an intrinsic definition of characters of torus, of a torus. Any questions about this? Actually, I wonder yes. if it is so natural to have it, have to define like an addition, a blue addition. Why not do multiplication? Because we will be very often using identification with Zn. And for example, when n is 1, it would be very strange to write that 2 times 3 is 5. But that's obvious too. So. That's, that's why it's probably when we think about it as Zn, it's much more natural to use the coordinate-wise addition and denote it by addition. But you can do this for any algebra. It has nothing to do with story. I can, so, so there will be a lecture for characters of a group. Yes. Combinative algebra, you can do this without adding uh, torus. Yes, so, so you, you, you mean define characters and so on. So there will be a general definition of a character in, I think, two lectures. And then we will talk about characters and what can we do with them and representation theory. But right now, I think this is the first time many people maybe see a character and I just want to define it for a torus. I don't uh, want to talk about... Can we then change the blue... Then, when we do the more general stuff, will we then introduce a multiplication? No. <laughs> Sorry. No. Then we will do the multiplication by addition. You, you can characters for any community by the algebra. You can characters group by multiplication. Yes. But you can, of course, you can of course yes. now say, I write the multiplication like an addition. But yes. it doesn't really seem to be so natural. 
<laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's, it's really very natural if we use an identification. And for example, we work with n equal 1. It's, it would be really mysterious to write that 7 times 3 is 10. No? I mean, OK. And it's really standard in toric geometry to use addition on a lattice. So what's a lattice? Let me, let me maybe define a lattice for me. So I mean, in mathematics, there are many lattices. So a lattice is a group isomorphic with Zn for some n. Yes, so it's, it's just a free abelian group. When I say a lattice, I mean a very simple object. And this is why when I'm dealing with lattices, I prefer to use addition. So I, here with addition. Yes, and in particular, characters of a torus, they form a lattice. For that reason, I use a plus for characters. OK. Now, how can we state this definition in terms of characters? So to define a toric variety, what do we do? To define a toric variety, we need to specify a finite subset of characters. Of a torus. So when I say a torus, I always mean the algebraic torus defined on the left board. Any questions about this? Because characters, they correspond to Loron monomials, and I just take the Loron monomials, I take the map from the torus, and I take the Zariski closure. And the Toric geometry, to a big extent, is the study of the geometry of toric variety through the much simpler geometry of a finite subset of points in Zn. OK, and we will see a few, a few uh, examples. So first of all, we should notice that when we take a subset, let's call this subset A in the lattice M, then it does not have to be that it generates as a subgroup whole M. It could be a smaller subgroup. For example, if we take two in Z, it generates even numbers. It doesn't generate the whole Z. And we will use the notation M tilde is the group generated by A. And because this is a subgroup of a free abelian group, it's also a free abelian group. So it has also a structure of Z to the D. As even numbers inside of Z, even numbers as a group, it's also a Z. Yes? When you identify 2K with K. So a first proposition that the images of those maps are really easy if we don't take the closure and if we don't look in the affine space, but if we look in the torus. So here we start with a fixed toric variety and 
<laughs> yes, so this is like a fixed toric variety, and we will use those things to define a map. If you want, I can, I can use a small k here, because I started with a small k, which probably was a mistake. Uh, and we will not be looking, as you will see, at the toric variety. We will look at something smaller. So notice that the image of this map, because these are monomials, it's not really in k to the k, it's in k star to the k. And we will say what's the image inside this k star to the k. So the image of a torus in, so by the map, This is also a torus. In fact, the characters <coughs> are exactly the M tilde. OK? So what we are saying is that this map, if we really look at the image, not the closure of the image, the image is a torus. It may be embedded in a very strange way in an affine space, but it's also a torus. And I will present a sketch of the proof of, of this fact. OK. So, if we look at the map of algebraic varieties, recall from lecture two that such maps are always represented by maps of rings in the opposite direction. So this is a torus with the algebra and the map goes in the opposite direction to the torus T, whose algebra is this. OK, what's the map? Where is y i sent? That's a question for you to check if we are on the same page. Where does y i go? So what's the algebra map? if I take this map geometrically. Yes? Did we go to x to the ai? Yes. Exactly. Very good. OK. Now, what's the image of the variety? Well, the image of the variety is given by an ideal here in this algebra. So when does a polynomial vanish on the image? The polynomial vanishes on the image even only if it goes to 0. So in other words, we would like to understand the image of a variety through its ring of functions, which is this ring modulo the kernel. But what's a ring modulo a kernel? It's isomorphic to the image of this map. So our aim is to understand the ring that is the image of this map as an algebra. What is the image of this map? So first, what kind of monomials can I get here, Laurent monomials? Can anyone tell me? So I definitely can get x to ai's, but what kind of algebra does this generate? Sorry, so you started from a torus, not any toric varieties. There is no toric variety here. This is a statement about a torus. So I map, I map a torus to a torus, and I claim that the image is also a torus, and I look at the map of algebras associated to a torus, and I want to understand the image through the kernel of this map, because the ring representing the image 
is this ring modulo the kernel, but the ring modulo a kernel, that's a basic algebraic property, is isomorphic to the image of this map. So we need to understand the image of this ring inside of this ring. And I already got some answers that, for example, x to ai's will be in the image. But maybe something more. The whole sublet is m tilde. The whole sublet is m tilde. Very good. Image as a vector space has basis m tilde. Because the only thing that I am allowed is to multiply those things, ai's, yes? And they're inverses, because I also have inverses. So remember that y a i minus 1 goes to x minus a i. Yeah? OK. And notice that the multiplication is in this algebra is encoded by addition in this lattice. So what we get, what we get is that the image equals spec of k of m tilde. So what is this notation? It's a notation for a ring whose basis elements correspond to elements of m tilde. And multiplication is induced from addition in m tilde. OK, so uh, there is a small cheat in this proof. Can anyone see this? where I cheated a little. So what I really described is the Zariski closure of the image, because I looked at polynomials that vanish on the image, and I represented it as a ring. But in fact, in this case, you can treat it as an exercise. The image and the Zariski closure of the image in the torus, they coincide. OK. I, I have a question. Yes. Okay, so. So what do you mean it generates a sublattice? So you have a lattice. Yes. I take points elements. and I'm allowed to so I take the smallest sublattice that contains those elements and explicitly I mean that I can add and subtract those elements. Yes, but that, that's okay. But um, but what Okay, okay, so okay, now I, I, I state my question and then I state the answer. The question was if there is a condition in the proposition, and now I state the answer. The answer is no, it's just a notation. Okay. <laughs> and tilde, that's not a condition, that's just a notation. That's just a notation for a sublattice generated by characters, and it's at the same time the condition on being as a monomial in the image of this map. Yes, but it's not a condition. Okay. Yes, it's just a notation. That's true. Yes. So you took a torus, look at the lattice, pick a sub lattice, take the image, and the image is also a torus. That's the. Yes, the image is also. So the image of a torus by a monomial map is a torus. That's the conclusion of this yes, proposition. Uh, yes? Here, yes. Okay. Yes, that's the end of the proof. Okay. But is it then, do I correct that the, 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 the definition of a torus is to be spec of k of some letters? Yes. Okay. I don't think it's so clear here on the left board that this is the definition. Yes, so we should notice what is the basis of this ring as a vector space. What's the basis of this ring as a vector space? A question for you. What's the natural basis of this? This is a ring, so in particular, it's a vector space. It's ZN. It's ZN. But what is that N? ZN is the lattice of characters. So I can also write this as K of M. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying it wasn't so clear in the beginning. OK, but now it's clear, yes? Can you repeat what was the cheat? The cheat was that I'm describing the image through its ideal. So I'm describing the image of a variety by looking at polynomials that vanish on the image. By definition, polynomials that vanish on the image are those in the kernel of this map. So this describes the closure of the image. 
but I claim that the image in this case is already closed. So it doesn't matter if I, so what I really proved is that the closure of the image is, is a torus. But take it for granted or as an exercise that it is, it is a torus. So this proposition gives us an equivalent definition of toric varieties because we see that they are really closures of subtori of an affine space. Because the image of a torus is a torus. Yes, if I take this map, the honest image, not the closure of the image, is a torus. Yes, and I define a toric variety as a closure of the image. So it's a closure of a torus. So equivalently, affine toric varieties. This is the same as the closure of a sub torus of a closure of a sub torus of k star to the end. So this is a torus. It can contain a sub torus. And then a closure of such a sub torus is an affine toric variety. And any affine variety is a closure of such a sub torus. And now you're deleting closure in k to the n. Yes. So closure in k to the n. OK? Very good. OK. So if you understand this proof very well, you will be able now to describe the algebra of the toric variety. So that's a question for you. What is an algebra of a toric variety? So we take x, a toric variety defined by defined by a finite subset of characters. So I would like to say that x is the spectrum of some algebra. And what kind of algebra? So now, remember, I look at the image of this map, or as the closure of the image, but now in the polynomial ring. So now, I do not have inverses. I do not have inverses because I look in the affine space. I take the same map, but I don't have the inverses. What do I get as the image? I don't have inverses. Sorry? Can you say again why? So now I really look at this map, not in the torus, but in the affine space. So this map is represented by exactly the same map, but this ring changes. It's no longer a ring of the torus. It's the ring of the affine space. And the ring of the affine space are just the polynomial rings in Ys. What's the image now? So now I do not have inverses. Like k of a, but without the tilde? V very good, but we have to, okay, so let's, let's make it clear what do we mean by k of a. We can denote it like that. That's a good option to describe the image of this ring. So I somehow need to describe all monomials that lie in the image of this map. What's the basis of, the vec of this as a vector space? What kind of Laurent monomials lie in the image? A's, you are going to say this, yes. What else? Is there anything else than AIs in the image? Uh, sums. Sums. Okay, so recall that the monoid is like a group 
but you don't have inverses. Yes? It becomes a cone. It, it will come to cones in a second. Right now, what we are allowed to do is we are allowed to add elements of A. So as a basis, as a vector space, as a vector space, the basis is the basis are the basis elements are elements of the monoid monoid generated by A. Yes? So we have a finite number of points in Zn. We take a monoid that they generate, which means that we just are allowed to add them as many times as we want. This becomes an infinite set that is a basis of the vector space. So we define this as a vector space, and we want to put a ring structure on it. What's the ring structure? It comes, we have to t I have to tell you how to multiply two elements that correspond to elements of this monoid. How do I multiply them? So if I take m1 corresponding to a monoid element and m2 corresponding to a monoid element, what's m1 times m2 in this algebra? Anyone? Yes? The sum of m1. The sum of m1 plus m2, very good. Uh, Matthias, question? Yes? How do we get the zero? Or wait, do we assume? Yeah, so monoid contains zero, always. So yeah, so A has to be, the origin has to be in A. No, no, it doesn't have to be. Somehow, a smallest monoid always contains a zero. So this corresponds somehow to a unit in this algebra. So generating a monoid means adding, but you are also allowed to add over an empty set formally, which would give you a zero. So every monoid, that's that the word is mono from a monoid, it needs to contain a zero. It's not a semi-group. OK. So this is quite abstract, so let's do examples. You will do examples. Let's look at our cuspidal curves. What are the characters? We already heard what are the characters of a, for a cuspidal curve. Z to the square and Z to the three. So as elements of Z, cuspidal curve. Let's draw it. So I have my integers, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. And I take the character corresponding to 2 and to 3. What monoid do they generate? What's the monoid that 2 and 3 generate? Is 0 in this monoid? Yes, because 0 is in every monoid. <laughs> is 1 in this monoid? No, because I cannot add 2 and 3 to get 1. Is 4 in this monoid? Very good. What else is in this monoid? OK, I see you're making a gesture that everything farther. OK, so that's the monoid. 2 is also in this monoid. 3 is also in this monoid. So notice that these points form a basis of this algebra. As a vector space, what is this? This is a unit plus z square plus z to the third plus z to the fourth as a vector space. Yes? And now if I want to multiply z square plus z to the four, I get z to the six, which corresponds to the fact that two plus four equals six. Okay. Now let's do one more example. Let me erase this first. And you can start thinking about your first example, the affine space. So let's take A2 and what, or let's take even A1. What are the characters that define the affine line? What's the lattice? What's the monoid? And before I erase, you can give me the answer if I find the, okay. So the distinguished character is one. What's the monoid? Uh, 
OK, we have to go again slowly. Yes. Is 0 in this monoid? Yes. <laughs> Is 2 in this monoid? Is minus 1 in this monoid? You can say it aloud. <laughs> Is it minus 1 in the monoid? No. So what's, what's the monoid? Negative integers. Yes, non-negative integers. So the algebra is this, which is just the polynomial ring in one variable. And you know that an affine line, the ring that represents it, are polynomials in one variable. OK, now there is a fundamental difference between this and this. What's the difference between this monoid and the second one? Anyone? Sorry? Yes. So there is a one here, and there is no one here. So this monoid has a hole inside of it. So this motivates the following definition. A monoid S is saturated in a lattice M if and only if for every positive integer, if it's multiply and every element, okay, and every element of the lattice, if a multiplicity of a monoid, uh, of a point in the lattice belongs to the monoid, then the point also belongs to the monoid. That's a definition. OK, which of these two monoids is saturated? This is not our class. Oh, no, 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 this is, this is really times. So this means S plus plus S K times. That's the multiplication in, in the lattice. So we have two monoids. One of them is saturated. Which one? The second this one. one. Yes, the second one. And this one is not saturated because of one. OK, very good. So I told you that there are several definitions of a toric variety, and one of them requires the variety to be normal. If you want to read about normality condition in algebraic geometry, you can do it in, in many standard books. We will not cover it in these lectures. For example, Atiya MacDonald has a whole chapter on, on normality. But we will define an affine toric variety represented by represented by uh, a, a subset of a lattice is normal even only if the monoid generated by s sorry, generated by A, is saturated in M tilde. So in the lattice spent by A. Now fact, normal, or maybe not normal, This is, in general, in algebraic geometry. This implies singular. So there is only an implication. But for curves, there is even only if. So we have a first example how to study the geometry of a toric variety using this finite set of points. Say you don't know cusps, you already see that this curve needs to be singular because the monoid is non-saturated. And this curve, the one on the top, A1, is smooth because the monoid is saturated. And more generally, if you are interested in normality, you can read off from the, 
uh, from the monoid associated to, uh, to the toric variety. Any questions about this? And I should say that some authors require affine or, in general, toric varieties to be normal. So you have to be careful if you read articles about toric varieties. It might be part of the assumptions. So there is uh, one whole and one singular point. Like uh, there is a relation from the number uh, between the number of holes and. Like, so there is a relation, but you cannot say you cannot say it in 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 in, in such a simple way. You can construct worse caps that will have more holes, mm -hmm. and yet uh, it will be it will be uh, 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 just one singular point. So in this part, we have seen in previous lectures that a very important problem in algebraic geometry is implicitization, trying to find equations of uh, algebraic varieties given as images of maps. And we will see that this problem greatly simplifies for toric varieties. That is, I will now provide you a complete description of the ideal of the toric variety. So recall that a binomial is a difference of two monomials. Okay, so point one tells us that any integral relation among points that define the toric variety give us, gives us a binomial in the ideal of that variety. Point two tells us that all binomials are of this form. And point three tells us that any polynomial in the ideal is a linear combination of binomials in Ix. So these linear relations, they give us a complete understanding of the whole ideal. And I leave the proof as a not difficult exercise. It's in fact similar to understanding the algebra of the image. You have to see when such a difference is in the kernel of the map, and this exactly will translate to such linear relations. And point four, point three, you need to do an easy induction on the support of the polynomial. This is a very simple fact. So we see that the ideal of a toric variety, well, it's a closure of the image. So it is a prime. 
binomial ideal. What do I mean by a binomial ideal? I mean generated by binomials. An ideal is binomial if it is generated by binomials. And it turns out that this is, in fact, a characterization of ideals of toric varieties. So every prime ideal generated by binomials defines an affine toric variety. OK. Is this statement understandable? And one implication is a direct consequence of this lemma. The other one requires a little work and relies on the fact that the toric variety is a closure of an arbitrary torus. And binomials on a torus translate to the fact that a Loro monomial is equal to 1, because we can divide by one of them. And such things have to define a subtorus. OK. Before I finish, I want to define cones. If, I mean, before we make a break, formally. So someone already mentioned that these semigroups, they look a little bit like cones. But definitely, a semigroup corresponding to a line looks more like a cone than this semigroup. So we will see that we will need some additional assumptions. But first, we need a definition of a cone. Sorry, it's not enough for the deal to be binomial if it is generated by binomials. I mean, generated as a using multiplication. Generated by binomials, I mean that the set of generators is chosen as binomials. Yes, but so. Not only multiplication, you are also allowed to add. Yes, yes, I understand. But sir, you say that any element of the deal is a linear combination. Yes. So that's a consequence. Yeah. It's a stronger fact. Of course. But in the assumptions, the binomial ideal is an ideal generated by binomials. I'm not claiming that everything here is so trivial that we can do it in five seconds. But I'm claiming that you can do it. OK. So a, a convex polyhedral. Cone in a real vector space V is a subset of the form lambda one V one plus lambda k v k for some for some fixed v i's in v and arbitrary lambda i in r greater or equal than zero yes so in a plane I have a zero, I take three points, and I take all their positive linear combinations, and I get what looks like a cone. And I will not say convex polyhedral cone, I will simply say a cone. And we will say that if we identify V with RD, then a cone is rational if we may have vi's in q to the d. So if I would put this ray through one square root of two, this would not be a rational cone. But if I'm allowed to pick here a rational point and here a rational point, then I will call this cone rational. And from now on, we'll be just dealing with convex polyhedral rational cones. Let's make a five minutes break. Thank you. 
Okay. So let me make you work. We have convex rational polyhedral cones that I just call cones. And we can associate to it a monoid. What kind of a monoid? Well, we can just take all lattice points inside of that cone, yes? So if we had our affine line, the cone would be just non-negative reals, and the monoid were non-negative integers. So what we get is a finitely generated. This finitely generated comes from the fact that the cone is rational. This, someone already pointed this out, it's a saturated monoid. I'm sorry, is it, is this amounts to identification? To yes. The specific identification of the microspaces RD? Yes, yes. So I, not only a vector space with RD, but also a lattice in, in that vector space with ZD. Yes. Finitely generated, saturated. If you are worried about these identifications, you can also do it just by specifying a lattice in a vector space without identifying V with RD. But probably with thinking in coordinates is maybe simpler. Finitely generated, saturated monoid. And if we have a finitely generated saturated monoid, we can take its algebra, and what we get is a normal toric variety. Fine. So I hope I persuaded you about this. And and I even persuaded you about this, that normal toric varieties, they were almost by definition coming from saturated monoids. And an exercise is that these are convex rational polyhedral cones if we take the cone spent by the monoid. So we have three distinct ways about thinking about really different objects. This is a discrete object, this is a continuous polyhedral object, and this is a variety. And they are all the same. So in other words, we can think about normal toric varieties as cones. In the lattice, so all this happens in M tilde. OK. So from now on, you assume that the cone is rational? Yes, when I will be saying a cone, I mean a convex rational polyhedral cone. I will be not repeating it. That's a cone for me. So don't think about like a round cone, quite the opposite. It needs to be like, if you, if you think about a three-dimensional thing, you should, you should think about something like this. I mean, it is an infinite cone, but it's chopped off. And by what it's chopped off, it's the next definition. Yes, I, okay, so people are a little, look a little confused. Uh, let me, let me show you a cone. So imagine this is zero, and you go, you have a plane here, a plane here, and a plane here, and you take all points, so this would be in the cone, you look from here, and this wouldn't be in the cone, because it's on the other side of this plane. So this is what you should imagine when I, when I say a cone. OK. So we need a few more basic definitions. A face. F of a cone. Cone C in V is, it's a subset of a cone on which certain function vanishes so f is a linear function it's in the dual vector space so this is not removing zero that's the dual vector space a linear function such that for every point in the cone, f of p is non-negative. That's a phase. So if we have our cone, 
I take a linear function that is positive on a cone. So it doesn't intersect the interior of a cone. And I see how it meets the cone. It can meet a cone in the edge. It can meet a cone in something two-dimensional. And all these are faces. It can also meet in zero. Empty. Sorry? Empty. No, it always meets in zero because that's a linear function, so it always vanishes on zero. Okay. But a priori it could be the whole cone if I take f equal to zero. So it can be full. Okay. Very good. Um, so let's do let's do maybe one. Ah, and one more definition, if the dimension of a face uh, is equal to the dimension of a cone minus one, then F is called a face set. Yes, that's the topological dimension. So that's it. I mean, we are talking about things that are, that are, that have a linear structure. You can also say that this is the dimension of the vector space spent by, by this face. That's a very good question. I, I hope to like sweep it under the rug, but this is a very easy dimension. Yes? So let's do, let's do an example. Yes? Uh, then in the definition of rational form, you only think about VI when they are on the face. Like if they, for example, you have one, if you look at a picture. Yes. Then they so the, the, in the media, but we don't care about that because it's... Mm, a very good question. And to answer that question, I wrote this may. Because you can always add more generators that are irrational or something. But the, the, the generators that you absolutely need are those that are on one dimensional faces known as rays. Those you really need, because if you omit them, there is no chance of generating something on that ray. So this may means that on each ray, you can find a rational vector. But even if you have a rational cone, you can of course add a point in the middle that is irrational. But this does not change the property of the cone. Okay. Let's take a cone known as the positive quadrant in R2. How many faces it has? Yes? What kind? And two face sets. And two. two face sets. Two one dimensional face sets. And then the extremal point? Z one. Zero, uh, zero dimensional face. And okay, maybe the whole thing. Is and maybe the whole thing. One, two dimensional, just the cone. Yes? Because I can take such a linear function, it will cut zero. I can take such a linear function, it will cut array. I can take such a linear function, it will cut array. And I can take zero that will cut out the whole cone. OK. So the amazing thing is that these cones, they completely describe the geometry of the toric variety. OK. How did we define the toric varieties? Well, we defined them as closures of a subtorus in C star to the K, and the closure in C to the K. Yes? OK. Now, this is an algebraic group. We can multiply points of T tilde by points of T tilde, and we are still in T tilde. If we have a group acting on a dense subset of an algebraic variety, this action extends to the whole algebraic variety. 
What I said may sound complicated, but it's really easy. It says, take a point in X. Take a point in T tilde. In particular, it's also a point in X. Multiply them. And you get also a point in X. And you can use an easy topological argument to, to see that this is correct. Our aim is to describe orbits of this action. Yes? So I pick a point from X and I look at all points I can get by multiplying by any point of t tilde, and I see what is this. Can anyone describe me one orbit? One orbit we already know very well. For a special point small x, what do we get? Anyone? If we take zero, but we, we should be a little careful. So notice that the point one, 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 one is also a toric variety. I can take all the monomials equal to one, and then it doesn't have a zero. So in particular, if zero belongs to my affine variety, that's true, then this would be an orbit, but there is an easier orbit, even easier than just zero. What is t tilde as a subset of x? It's Doris, which is trapped in the itself trapped in the Yeah, 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 yes, yes. The whole orbit is That's That's already an answer. It's not an answer to it, but that's an answer to it, yes? If we take so what, what I'm hearing is that if we take x in t tilde, then the orbit is what? It's just t tilde, yes? This is a transitive action. If I take any element of a group, I can get any other element of the group by multiplication, yes? And that's a dense orbit. But by the way, maybe you can also answer this question in coordinates. How can I check? If my point in an affine space that belongs to X, is it in T tilde? Should have all coordinates on zero? All coordinates on zero, and we proved this. We proved this because we proved that the image of a torus is a subtorus if we look at the points with coordinates non-zero. So this, that was the characterization of T tilde, that if we look at all coordinates non-zero, we are getting T tilde, exactly. Okay, so we have one dense torus orbit that is just the torus T tilde, and it consists of those points in the variety that have all coordinates non-zero. So now, there will be other orbits, but they will always have sum of the coordinates equal to zero. And what turns out, and it's very beautiful, is that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between these orbits and faces of the cone. And this is known as the orbit cone correspondence. Let me write you the theorem. So let's, let's assume that X comes from a cone. X is toric variety from, from a cone C. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence between T orbits, between T orbits in X and faces of and faces of C. And I will, I will describe you this bijection very, very explicitly. 
But for that, notice that we have also this set A in Zn, the generators of the cone as a monoid, and our variety lives in C to the cardinality of A. So we can talk about a coordinate of the point corresponding to a given element of A. Yes, the coordinates of the ambient space, they correspond to elements of the set A. Some people are nodding, but some look maybe a little lost. Re re remember this because we will be coming back and forth. The toric variety was given by monomials corresponding to elements of A. So each monomial gives you a coordinate that corresponds to an element of A. Okay? Okay. So, so I need to build this correspondence. So let's choose a face of a cone and I have to tell you which points X belong there. So if I have a point in X, I can talk about its eighth coordinates for A in A. Yes, it's a point in this space. And the coordinates are indexed by elements in A. And I want this to be zero if and only if A is not in the face. Yeah? So I look at those points in X, and some of the coordinates are zero, some of them are non-zero. But I want the non-zero coordinates to be exactly on the face. And that's the complete description of orbits. So what is this orbit? What kind of face it is? You have to see what are the zero coordinates of x. Which are? Zero or non-zero. Zero or non-zero, but X, T tilde has all coordinates non-zero. So what's the phase corresponding to this dense orbit? Well, nothing is zero. So nothing is not in the phase. So everything is in the phase. So what's the phase? The whole, the whole cone. Yes? OK. So in the notes, you will find several examples. For example, in A2, we have, so remember, the positive quadrant corresponds just to the two-dimensional affine space. And we have this whole cone that corresponds just to C star squared. Now, we have two one-dimensional face sets. Well, they will correspond to two sets of the form zero something non-zero or something non-zero, zero. And we have one zero-dimensional phase, which is just the point zero, zero. And this gives you a stratification of C square according to the orbits of the torus. Yes, this is one orbit. If you take any point that is non-zero and zero, you can bring it to any other point that is non-zero and zero by multiplying by an element of a torus. And this works in general. Further, you can read off how the varieties intersect from this picture. So the orbits, they never intersect, but the closures may intersect. So one of these orbits corresponds to a ray, the second orbit corresponds to the other ray. They intersect in zero, which means that the closure of this orbit intersects the closure of this orbit in the closure of the orbit corresponding to zero, which is the point zero, zero. So complete geometry of the toric variety can be read off from the cone, where faces, they correspond to torus orbits or their closures. Okay, 
So now we pass to projective toric varieties. And the story for projective varieties is not really very different than for the affine varieties, but let me, let me make some of the necessary definitions. So remember that we have defined the projective variety, again, as an image of a monomial map in the projectivization of CK, or K to the K. But let's work over the complex numbers. And, uh, and there was a comment here that maybe I should not define it like that, because when these monomials are non-homogeneous, I can get a different representative under scaling. Well, I can define the closure of the image equivalently. So remember, AIs are in Zn. And the image will not change if I will add a non-zero factor. And this is what people often do when studying projective toric varieties. They put the exponents, they add a variable, and put the exponents at height one in a bigger lattice. Why? Because now, looking at the image in the projective space is the same as looking at the image in the affine space and taking a cone. Because now the image is already a cone because I'm allowed to multiply by a non-zero factor. Okay? So when we will be talking about projective toric varieties, again, they are given by a finite set of characters, but we will put them at height one according to a certain grading in the lattice. Sorry, what if A1 and AK are not of the same degree? They, they can be not of the same degree. They can be not of the same degree. Yes. Yeah, is, is the map still well defined? It is well defined because, okay, so the map to CK is always well defined. And th this map is also well defined. Well, okay, I'm cheating. This map is not well defined when, when some of the coordinates are equal to zero. But remember that the image of this map has all of the coordinates non zero. So this really factors. If you want to go to a projective space, it's factors for C star to decay. But the problem is that the image in the C star to decay, it does not have to be a cone. And to make it better, we add this additional variable. So now, notice that all of the theorems we stated, they can be translated to the projective setting. For example, how would you find equations, polynomials, that vanish on the image? How would you describe the ideal of a projective toric variety? Uh, sorry, but in this case, yes. you end up in, P, uh, in PK minus 1, right? Yes. Okay. So C, P of CK, I mean PK minus 1. Yes. So there is a shift of dimension by 1. If the dimension of the cone is d, the dimension in the projective space is d minus 1, because I contract rays. OK. So that was a question for you. How do you find equations of a projective toric variety? Well, the equations of a projective toric variety are exactly the same as the equations of the affine cone over that variety. So what do you need to find? You need to find integral relations among these exponents. Yes, this is the theorem I stated an hour ago. But this is completely determined because, I mean, sorry, the, the degree of these equations will have to be homogeneous. Because notice that if we have points that have one coordinate equal to one, the degree of the polynomial will be exactly 
what we get on this coordinate. Yes, if we have points, two, three, one, two, two, one, whatever, one, if we add them, so this corresponds to a monomial of degree three, and the last coordinate when we add them will be three. So in other words, if we have any relation that was written, that was written as, I want to use the same notation, bi ai, but now I have ai comma one is equal to cj aj comma one, then this implies that the sum of bi's is equal to the sum of cj's. That's the last coordinate. And that's the degree of the associated binomial. So we are really getting homogeneous equations of the projective toric variety. Okay. Now, a definition. X in a projective space is projectively normal. even only if the affine cone in the vector space is normal. So we want to answer the question, when is the toric variety projectively normal? So we have our lattice. We have some points at height one, A1 up to AK, and we want to know when do these points generate a saturated monoid? I should write a1, comma 1, ak, comma 1, but I will not be writing this once anymore because I'm always in the projective setting. Any idea when a set of points at height 1 generates a saturated monoid? That's a hard question, but maybe you can at least guess a necessary condition. I can take the convex hull of the points, A1 up to AK, and I can look what kind of lattice points do I have there. And this has to be what? Am I allowed to have a hole here? Notice that if I have a hole here, this will be a contradiction to saturation because this is a rational combination of A1 up to AK, so I can take a high multiple which will make this an integer, positive integer combination of AIs. So a necessary condition is that this is A1 up to AK. But it turns out that this is not enough. And this is a little surprising. So we need two definitions. A polytop. You can fail. Yeah, I take, this is my A1, this is my A2, this is my A3. I take the convex hull. The convex hull contains zero, uh, sorry, contains one, one. For example, it's this, times half plus this times half, but it's not one of the AIs. This is in M tilde. It is in the lattice generated by those things. And this is in the convex hole, sorry. It is in the convex hole, it is in the lattice, but it's not here. Yeah? Check that this is in the lattice. Yes? Could you explain one more time why this is a necessary condition? Yes, because if this does not hold, as in here, so we have a point P that is 1 half 0, 1 
plus 1 half to 1. I can multiply it to clear the denominators. And I get that 2p is in the monoid. It is in the monoid. But p is not in the monoid. Because no matter how I will be adding those things, I will never get back to height 1. But the surprising thing is that even if I don't have holes at level 1, I can have holes later. And that's not so easy to see. OK. So a polytop, a polytop uh, in, in a vector space V is a convex hull. Of, of a finite subset. Of vectors. If we have a lattice in the vector space, then P is a lattice polytop. If it is a convex, convex hull of a finite, of a finite subset, now of M, not of V. So a lattice polytop means that it's a convex hull of you can think integer points. And because we will be taking convex hull of AIs, we will be dealing with lattice polytops. Hmm? And we need the last definition to answer our problem. When is the convex, when is the projective toric variety projectively normal? We need a definition of a normal lattice polytop. a lattice polytop is normal if for every positive integer and every lattice point in k times p, there exist k lattice points such that p is their sum. Now, it's amazing that not every lattice polytop is normal. So it's not true that if I scale a polytop k times, and take any lattice point, it has to be a sum of k lattice points. And in the exercises, you have explicit examples of polytops that are not normal. It's not so easy to draw them because the first one appears in dimension three. So in dimension two, everything is normal. And once you know this definition, it is a really easy exercise that x is a projectively normal normal toric variety represented by characters in the polytop. So our AIs is the convex hull, well, the P is the convex hull of the AIs, and it's represented by the lattice points. It's projectively normal if and only if P is normal. So this definition assures that there are no 
higher level holes in the monoid generated by the polytop. I really strongly encourage you to take a look at non-normal polytops, try to generate the monoid, try to see the holes, and, and see what happens. So by X projectively normal, you mean that the... Um, Fine cone over it is normal. Meaning that the um, lattice points is a saturated sublattice? Yes, if we talk about toric varieties, we mean that the monoid that the lattice point generate is saturated meaning that there are no holes in the cone that, we, that, that they generate. Okay, so now we make one step farther and we try to understand the orbit cone correspondence for normal, projectively normal projective toric varieties. <clears throat> we take a polytop. Let's say that it's a normal polytop, yes? And the algebra of the cone over this projective toric variety is given. Uh, so this P lies in height one. And the fact that it's normal, it means that if we generate a monoid with it, we get everything in the cone. Okay, how can I see the orbits when I look at the polytop? Well, notice, so it sounds difficult, but this map is a toric map. It preserves the torus action. So orbit gets mapped to orbit. And we know the orbits in the fine case. Well, there are the one-dimensional orbits corresponding to rays. There are four two-dimensional orbits. So what I took, I don't know if, if this picture is visible. I took a polytop, I put it at height one, and I drew a cone over it. So it has four one-dimensional faces. How many two-dimensional faces? Four. Yeah, one, two, three, four, yeah? Okay, and when we look at the affine variety, we will get four two-dimensional orbits and four one-dimensional orbits. But the dimension drops by one when we projectivize. So in the projective variety, we get four zero-dimensional orbits and four one-dimensional orbits. So we don't have to, we can forget the cone. We can now just look at the polytop. And you can guess what's the definition of a face of a polytop. Again, I need to take a linear function, but now an affine linear function that is positive on the polytop. And I look at its zeros. And the projective toric variety corresponding to the polytop will have four torus invariant points corresponding to the vertices of the polytop, it will have four one-dimensional torus orbits, and then there will be a dense torus represented just by the polytop. Some people are nodding. Are there questions about this? Okay, I still have 15 minutes, so maybe an example will be, uh, will be good. Let's take the Segre. Do you remember the Segre? What are the character points? What's the polytop? Yeah, yeah, I heard something good. One zero one zero. Yes, these are the exponents of A, B, C, D. They go like one zero one zero. What else? Yeah, zero. 
one zero zero one zero one one zero zero one zero one. Okay. What is this polytope? What's its dimension? What it is? You know it from primary school, this polytope. Or maybe even kindergarten. I'm serious. <laughs> So notice that there are two linear equations. This plus this is always one, and this plus this is always one. So I can erase this row because it's uniquely determined and erase this row. Is this more familiar? What is the polytope? It's a square. Okay. So now I put it in height one, yeah? And I draw a cone. Okay, so there is a face, for example, corresponding a one-dimensional face corresponding of the cone corresponding to this vertex, yes? So I have to take points that are non-zero here and are zero here, zero here, zero here. So that was AC. So I have to take points that are non-zero here, zero here, zero here, zero here. If you remember, the Segre map is an embedding. So I can identify the image with P1 times P1. And this point, it's a point that has one here, zero here, and one here, zero here. Notice that this is in a projective space, so we don't care what we put here. We can assume that we put a one here, yes? So we found that this point of the polytop, it corresponds to a torus invariant point. One zero zero zero. All of the characters that do not belong to the chosen face are zero, and the character that belongs to the chosen face is non-zero. Let's take something more complicated. Let's take these two things. So now we have to be careful, because these two, they make a face, and these two, they don't make a face. So we need to take two things that, take, that make a face. So let's say these two things, they make a face. So now we need something that is non-zero here and non-zero here. But it's zero here and zero here. Okay, so what maps here? Well, you can verify that what maps there is something that is like one zero and anything non-zero here and anything non-zero here, okay? And this is indeed a torus orbit, yes? If I take a point, one zero here, and anything here, anything here, it will map exactly to this point in P3. Okay, so let's check if we are on the same page. What is the closure of this orbit as a projective variety in P3? What is its dimension and how is it called? A it's a line, it's a P1, okay. Why it's a line? Well, you can see that it corresponds to a segment. And the segment represents a P1 in a projective setting. And this works. You can really look at the face of a polytop and the orbit closure of the corresponding orbit is represented by the polytop given by that face. And you can also check that if I took the wrong vertices that do not form a face, this would fail. So for example, if I would take this and this, and I would like this to be non-zero and this to be non-zero and this two to be zero, I would not get a torus orbit. You can do it as an exercise. It will go wrong. It will not be closed under the torus action. Okay. So this uh, orbit faces a corresponding uh, preserves the dimension? Yes, it preserves the dimension, it preserves the geometry, meaning like the intersection of closures, and it also even preserves the structure, that is the closure corresponding to a phase F is really the toric variety represented by phase F. And what is more funny that the proofs of all these statements, they are easy. You can do it. They are maybe a little time consuming, but you don't have to use any complicated theorems. You can work out in coordinates. 
OK. So right now it seems magic. We have this projective toric variety. We have the polytope P. And somehow the geometry of X is completely reflected in P. The vertices, they correspond to torus invariant points. The segments, they correspond to one-dimensional subvarieties. The polytope corresponds to the torus in X. And to the end, I want to give you one more interpretation why this is not magic. I will define a map from this complex algebraic variety to P with very nice properties. Namely, it will be surjective, and it will just do some fiber contraction. OK. So the algebraic moment map is a map. So we, we, we fix a set of characters, and we get a map from the associated projective toric variety to, so A is a subset of Zn, to Rn. And it's defined as follows. Mu A of x, this is a sum over A in A, the module of x A A over the sum of all of the modules of XA. OK, we still have five minutes, so let's look at it. What do I mean by XA? Can anyone tell me? What can I mean by XA? So X is a point of the variety. A is a character. What do I mean by XA? So x is embedded in some c to the power cardinality of a, and a, xa is the eighth. Coordinate. Perfect. But there is one problem there. We are talking about a projective variety. So we really work in projectivization of c a. So a priori, I cannot talk about the eighth coordinate. I can only talk to it up to scalar. But th this fraction makes it well defined. If I multiply everything by lambda here and lambda here, it gets canceled. So this is a well defined map. Where does it belong to? Well, that's too much. I mean, we will go there in five minutes. But which polytope? Right. Yes. So this belongs to the convex hull of the AIs of the of the A. Can you see this? Because I take some coefficients and I divide by the sum of those coefficients. That's almost by the So I will decompose this map with by by, by two maps in in last two minutes. I should have erased more board. And let's do it. So at least we managed to define a map from the complex projective variety to the polytope, yes? And we would like to maybe understand this variety a little better, this map. So this map will have all the nice properties you can imagine, and this will be a let's say, a next level view on the orbit cone correspondence, because it maps points of a variety to the points of the, of the polytope. We need one more definition, and then I will just state. So if we have, if we have a toric variety, an affine toric variety, we define the positive and the non-negative part as the intersection of x with those coordinates that are non-negative, respectively positive. Uh -huh. 
OK. And we can look at the map from x to x non-negative, taking the point x1 up to x cardinality of a, and mapping it to their module absolute value. This is a well-defined map. And you can really well understand the fibers of this map. And there will, this will be the honest topological tori. I don't have a time to prove it, but it's, it's, uh, it's really easy. And now the miracle is that if we restrict the moment map here, it still goes to P. But the theorem tells us, and that's the last theorem I state, that if A, if A is a set of points of a lattice polytop, and, and x, and x, ah, sorry. And these definitions, they also make sense for a projective variety, where I say that the point in the projective space is non-negative if it has a non-negative representative, if there exists a non-negative representative, okay? And x, the associated toric variety. Then the moment map is a homeomorphism onto P. So this map has very well described fiber structure in terms of honest topological tori. And this map doesn't change the topology. It's basically a projection. And there is a, an example that is worked completely out in the case P1 times P1 that I was presenting. The positive part is a curved thing inside the square. You can look at the nodes. And you can rotate this. I can send you the code if you want. And you will see that it projects to a polytop that is a square, as we discussed. Thank you very much.